welcome back, everybody. If I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Pablo, and I have the opportunity to be here in our Young Adult Ministry team at Christ Fellowship. And we have something so special prepared for you guys today. But before we get to all of that, can we just take a few minutes to pray? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today, Lord. We thank you for this time. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing here and now. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will come and invade our spaces, God. Uh, and we just thank you. We thank you for all that you're going to do today, Lord. God, I ask that the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my Redeemer, Father. Let this be all for your glory, God. We thank you, Lord. We honor you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. I'm so excited to be here today with our online family. These past few weeks, we had the opportunity uh, to go through this new sermon series called Psalms for the Summer, where we unpack a few different psalms uh, in the Bible. And some of them are a little more popular, some not as popular, right? Week one, we looked over Psalm 23, a very, very popular uh, psalm that we see in the church, right, where we learned that uh, Jesus is our shepherd. After that, week two, we looked at Psalm 91, where we learned that Jesus is our refuge in time of trouble. And week number three, we unpacked Psalm 103, where we learned that Jesus is the only one that is worthy of our praise. And today, we're going to have the opportunity to unpack Psalm 63. So if you have your Bibles, you have your pens, I want to encourage you to pull them out, and we're going to read the scripture together. So Psalm 63, verses 1 through 8 says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise, praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. And because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. And I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. What a beautiful psalm. And what we know about this is that it's King David that wrote this. And, and what uh, theologians actually believe is that King David was uh, escaping in the Judean desert. He was actually running away either from uh, King Saul that was trying to kill him or Absalom that was trying to dethrone him. It was two different time uh, periods in history. So scholars are trying to figure out so which one it was. And, and what we see here is that uh, David was desperate for the presence of God. This is a psalm where, where you see there's a soul cry, a heart cry that David has saying, God, I need you. And what we see in this psalm is that uh, David's desperation was actually not circumstantial, but it was relational. Because in this time, David was going through a very difficult moment, difficult season. He was in a desert. It was probably really hot. Or maybe he was in a cave hiding. There was no water, no food. He was going through it. And instead of saying, God, I need you to provide for food. God, I need you to provide for shelter. God, I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Instead of doing that, David said, God, earnestly I seek you. He said, God, earnestly, I, I fervently, I continuously, I diligently seek you because I thirst for you. What a beautiful picture that David is painting before us to show us what is it like to be truly desperate for the presence of God. Because life will be life and struggles will come and we'll have those desert seasons and wilderness moments. And in those moments, what we tend to do is we run to God because we want God to help us in those moments. And God does because that's the character of our Father. But the heart posture that David is teaching us in this psalm is to be desperate for God above all things. And when we reach this point of desperation, it is a sign that we're looking for fulfillment somewhere in our lives. When we are desperate for something, it means that there is something that is not sufficing in our lives. Therefore, we, we're looking for that fulfillment. And the bridge between desperation and to fulfillment is the bridge of decision. It is what you choose to do in a moment of desperation that will fulfill you with the right thing or the wrong thing. 
Because many times what we do is when we feel a desperation in our hearts, when we are heartbroken, when we are sad, when we need help or anything like that, what we do is we either run to God and we're fulfilled by His presence to the point of overflow, or we run to the world where it leaves us even more empty and it becomes this vicious cycle where we have to continue coming back. And, and my prayer for today, my desire for today, is that after this message is done, you will be a little bit more desperate for God. And I believe that we can develop a desperation for God by truly just taking two decisions, making two decisions in our lives that will allow us to experience a desperation that will lead us to know God in a deeper way. The first one is that we must learn how to seek God through the desert. We must learn how to seek God through the desert. Psalm 63 verse 1 says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly, like right? I said earnestly. It's, it's fervently. It's, it's diligently. It's, it's time and time again. It doesn't stop. Earnestly, I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. David is painting this picture in this moment of his geographical location. He, he is showing us, I am in a, in a dry desert land where there is no water. But he is equating the geographical location, the things that he's experiencing physically, to the state of his heart and the state of his soul. A state of desperation, a, a state of, of dryness in his soul. So he needed God to be the one to fulfill the desert in his heart. Well, what is a desert, right? What categorizes a desert? Well, when I did some Googling, this is what I got. It says, a desert is a barren area of landscape where little precipitation occurs, and consequently, living conditions are hostile for plant and animal life. What well, that means, like, when the amount of evaporation in the landscape is, is greater than the annual rainfall, you got yourself a desert. But when there is more, more heat than there is water, you find yourself in a desert. Now, maybe most of us do not find ourselves in a place where there is a desert right outside the door. I know here in Florida, we do not. <laughs> the, the most sand that we get is when we go to the beach and there's a ton of water there. So it really doesn't count. But there is something that all of us have experienced, will experience, or are experiencing in this moment. And that's what scholars call the, 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 the wilderness of the soul. It is, it is the desert of the soul. And truly, some of the desert, some of the wilderness seasons that we experience are a product of our decisions. Are a product of the things that we have decided to do or not to do. It is a product of, of us probably being disobedient to God. Of choosing to sin. And, and what we know is that sin separates us from God. So when we are not close to God, we can feel and we feel like we're in a desert season, in a wilderness season, where truly God just feels so distant from us. But sometimes we are in wilderness seasons, not because of the things that we have done, but because life is just life. Sometimes life gets difficult. Sometimes finances don't add up. Sometimes that person that you walk with for many for a long time that you were in a relationship with, they walk away. Sometimes you experience loss in the family or someone that you love. Sometimes life will be life. And we can find ourselves in a wilderness season, in a desert season. And typically what we do when we're in a desert season, especially in the times where we're in a desert season that we have not caused on our own, a season that is not based on, on, on the product of our decisions. What we tend to do is we tend to come to God and ask God, why? Why is this happening, God? Why, why would you allow this? Why would this be possible? Why, 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 and why? We ask God why all the time, right? And I want us to kind of flip the, the script with that a little bit, to so switch the script and, 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 and maybe start, stop asking why, and start asking what. God, what are you teaching me in this season? God, what are you doing right now that I need to pay attention to? What are you doing right now? God, what is it that this season entails in my life that you have something prepared for me? You see how the tone changes drastically from a place of complaining, a place of lack, a place of anger and frustration 
to a place of like, okay, God, I'm looking to grow. I'm looking for you. I know you have something for me and I'm going to pursue it. So would you tell me what it is? And truthfully, we can't avoid desert seasons. We can't run from them, especially the ones that are not a product of, of our decisions. We can't, we can't escape those. But there is one thing that we can choose to do. And the one thing that we can choose is our response in the midst of one. It is what we decide to do when that wilderness season encounters us, what it is that we choose to do. Because the desert season has the power to develop you or it can deflate you. It, it has the ability to quench your thirst for God or crush your spirit. It could be a, a tool of spiritual formation or it could be a source of deconstructionism. It can strengthen your trust in God or fracture your faith in Him altogether. Or a desert season could deepen your devotion to God or fully expose your doubts about Him. And that is what we need to learn to make a decision as to how we're going to respond to that. And what I have seen in scripture and what i have seen in my personal life is that in the seasons where i feel like god is far away in the season where it's a it's a desert season it's a wilderness season it is an invitation that god is giving me to come closer to him it is a drawing from the holy spirit for me to come closer to god to pray just a little bit longer to stay in his presence just a few more minutes to read his word a little bit longer to to fast a little bit longer to be in worship a little bit louder to come to church a little bit more often it is a sign that God is drawing me to him and we see this in the Bible and in the Gospels in Matthew Mark Luke and John when when Jesus is being baptized and, and he ascends from from the water and the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove and, and what scripture tells us is that the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness Scripture tells us that, that after Jesus had this encounter with, with his father, because he heard said, this is my son who I love, I am well pleased, listen to him. Immediately after that, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. Mighty God, some of us cannot even go a day without eating. And he went 40 days without it. And not just that, but he was being tempted by the enemy in those 40 days. He overcame the temptation. And, and what scripture tells us, I believe it's in the book of Mark, that by the end of it all, angels were ministering to Jesus. What a powerful experience. What a powerful revelation. What a powerful moment that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness so that Jesus could see something new. He could experience something powerful. I remember in 2020, I had a, a very rude awakening in my life. 2020, I graduated college, and prior to that, the Lord led me to start a, a movement in, 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 in my college that stood revival within my campus. And we started seeing beautiful miracles, signs, and wonders. People were getting healed. People were uh, encountering the Holy Spirit for the first time. Uh, people were getting saved left and right. It was just a beautiful move of the Spirit. And once I graduated, I was home, and, and, I, and, and, and what happened is that I had this realization that uh, if, if miracles, signs, and wonders were not flowing through my life, I started to believe that God had left me. I started to believe that God had forsaken me. And, and this is because I had put miracle signs and wonders and the gifts of the Spirit in a place higher above knowing God Himself. Now, it is not wrong to desire miracle signs, wonders, and the spiritual gifts. It is biblical to desire those. Apostle Paul tells us that. But when, they, when the desire for, for a miracle sign, a wonder, or a spiritual gift is higher than your desire to know God personally, you have stepped into idolatry. And that's where I was at. I was idolizing the work of God and I was not pursuing God himself. And it really messed with me. It's horrible doctrine, horrible theology. And it really messed with me because I really thought that God had left me. And it took me two years to realize that it was God's goodness. It was God's grace that I was not able to operate in those gifts. Because in that time, I met him again. 
In that time, I learned to be desperate, not for the miracle, not for the sign, not for the wonder, not for the gift of the Spirit, not for the prophetic word, but I grew desperate for God himself. And from that place, I learned to live. That whether I prophesy or I don't, I still know God and I have everything that I need and my relationship is good. And we need to learn to be desperate for God and seek Him in the desert seasons and in the dry seasons. But not just that, but we need to learn to decide to remember that God develops in the dark. Psalm 63 verses 6 through 8 says, say, On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Here in this moment, what David is doing, he is actually recalling on who God is and all the things that God has done for him. And a great way to be desperate for God, a great way to learn how to, how to grow in desperation with God is to remember the things that he has done in your life. Because what that means is that if he has done it once already, he can do it again. If he has done it in someone else's life, he can do it in your life. Because that's the type of God that we serve. And when we remember what God has done, we, we remember the mountaintop moments. The moments where we're high up, where nothing could get us, nothing could bother us. We, everything was going well, life was great, finances were awesome, relationships were thriving, business was booming. It was great. But sometimes we need to be very careful with mountaintop moments because they are great. But if we are not careful, they can warp our thinking in a few ways. The first one is that we can start to believe that we don't need God since everything is going well. We, we, we can choose to put God in the back burner because there is no need for him. M many of us, what we do is we, we, we step out of church, we go and do our lives, live our life, do whatever we want to do. And the moment that hardship hits our household, the moment that we experience loss, the moment that things are not adding up, the moment that there is pain, that there is trauma, what we do is we run to God. We run to the church. We're in the front row. We're crying. We're asking for prayer. We're taking notes. And the moment that everything goes back to normal, the moment that the hardship has passed, the moment that God has met our need, we disappear from church. We disappear from being in relationship with God. And we need to learn how to be desperate for God in the desert season and in the mountaintop season. I, I saw this picture one time that it was a, it was a, it was a square and it was divided horizontally. Uh, and, and in the top portion of the picture, it was a man and, and he was on his knees, kind of like bowing down with his head down. And, and the little caption next to it said, uh, Seek God in the midst of trouble. And, the, and then the picture on the bottom portion of, 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 the, of, the, of the square, it was the same man on his knees, but instead of having his head down, he had his arms up. And, and, and then the caption next to it says, Praise God when everything is going the way it's supposed to. Either way, whether you're in the mountaintop or you're in the desert, the heart posture, the body posture that we need to learn to have is to be on our knees. And if nothing is going the way that it's supposed to, you get on your knees and you say, God, I need you. God, I am in desperate need of a miracle. Father, I need you to come for me. I need you to help. That is the posture. And when everything is going according to plan, when business is booming, when family is great, friendships are awesome, that is the moment you get on your knees and say, God, thank you that everything is going well. God, I am so grateful that everything has been going according to plan. The next way that our thinking can be warped is we can start to believe that we're in the mountaintop because of what we have done on our own merit, not because of what God has done for us. We, tend, we, we can believe that we're in the mountaintop because we work hard, because we did X, Y, and Z, we put all the work and all these, and we tend to rob the glory that God deserves. But we need to learn to realize that outside of God, we have nothing. And every good and perfect gift comes from God. So if you're in a mountaintop season, it's because God has put you in that place. 
It's not because you earned it. Yes, we can partner with God and we can be obedient to his word. But at the end of the day, it is the grace and the love of God that puts us in a mountaintop season. Let's look at the life of David, for instance. David was the youngest of eight brothers. He was overlooked. He was casted away, pushed to the side. No one really believed in him. But one day, everything changed for him. 1 Samuel chapter 16, scripture tells us that uh, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, and Samuel was a prophet in the Old Testament. And, and the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? Saul was the, the first king of Israel that did uh, something that was dishonoring to God. So, so God said, I'm going to choose a new king that will honor me. How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. So custom in those days is the prophet would grab a horn, they would fill it with oil, and when they found the king, where they would anoint a king, they would pour the oil on the king to say, this is God's chosen one. This is the one that God wants to be king. So God gives this instruction to Samuel to go to the house of Jesse, and he gets to Jesse's house, and he's like, hey, Jesse, I, I need to see your sons. I, I need to pick the, the next king of Israel. And Jesse grabs all his kids, he scrambles for them, and, and seven of them show up. Right, and Samuel is going kid by kid, right? The first one, tall, dark, and handsome. And he asks, Samuel, he asks God, hey, God, is this the one? And God tells Samuel, no, that's not the one. And then, and then Samuel went to, to the next one, not as tall, not as dark, not as handsome. <laughs> and, and, and Samuel asked, God, is this the one? And, and God said, no, this is not the one. And, and he, he did that with all seven of his kids. And then Samuel asked Jesse, he said, hey, Jesse, do you have another son? By any chance, is there, is there another one that, that may be hiding? And, and Jesse looked at Samuel and said, yeah, he, I do, I have a, a, another son, but he's not here. He, he, he is not in the room right now. He's actually out tending to the sheep. He, he's out there doing one of the worst and, and dirtiest and smelliest jobs you could have. So, so Samuel got up and went to the field and found David and, and then asked, God, is this the one? And God said, that is the one. Isn't that crazy that God chose the overlooked? God chose the one that wasn't even in the room? Let that sink in. David was not in the room when God was looking for his anointed one. And similarly for you and I, there are some rooms that you're not going to be in, but God has already chosen and has appointed that room for you. And what we see is that David was faithful. David was faithful to God. And what is crazy to me is that David got anointed king, but it's not like the next day he went and he stepped into the palace. No, 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 no. There was eight, an eight-year period between, between David being anointed king to the point where he became an actual king. And I don't know about y'all, but I'll be pretty upset if someone said, Pablo, you are the next king, and the next day I'm back tending sheep. I'll be pretty upset. Because I'd be like, God promised me I would do this. But I'm here going back to the same thing I've been doing over and over. What we know is that David was faithful to God. And he experienced a mountaintop moment when he was anointed king. He probably had a desert moment when he went back to tending sheep. But what happened is he was still faithful to the Lord. And then he ended up fighting a bear, fighting a lion, fighting Goliath. And then years later, he became the king of Israel. And David's mountaintop was not achieved by his efforts. He was tending the sheep. He was not in the room. But it was God's faithfulness. And because of that faithfulness, he was able to step into everything that God had for him. And mountaintop seasons and moments are reminders of God's faithfulness, not our efforts. And later on, David wrote these words in Psalm 63. Verses 2 and 4 says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. 
I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. David praised the Lord. David gave his heart to the Lord, and he remembered that all he wanted was just God. And right now we're going to transition into, into something that, 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 that is called Lectio Divina, which means divine reading in Latin. And this is just a, a contemplative exercise that dates to the early, early church, early centuries of the Christian church. And it's a way of praying scriptures that uh, leads us into a deeper encounter into God's word. And it has four different steps. The first, we will read the word. Then we will meditate on it. We will think on it. We will, we will chew on it. We will pray. And then we will contemplate. And if you're driving right now, I, I want to encourage you, pause it right here when you get home. Uh, open the video again. Because it's a time where you want to sit up, kind of sit up, get in a, in a relaxed position. So I'm going to actually invite you guys to do that right now. If you're home, uh, I want you to kind of sit up, put, put, put your phone, put the tablet, whatever it is to the side, and just close your eyes, put your feet on the ground, put your hands on your lap almost in a, in a way that you're going to receive a gift. And I want you to breathe in through your nose and, and breathe out through your mouth and, and, and get your heart rate to slow down a bit. And, and this is a moment where what I want you to do is to pay attention to the word of God. And as I read the scripture, let the Holy Spirit wash you with his words. Let God cleanse you with his word that is eternal. So if you guys want to close your eyes, I'm going to read Psalm 63. Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. And because you are my head, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Would you take this time to just meditate on that? Think about the words that were just read to you. I'm going to read it one more time. And now, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to highlight a word or a phrase or perhaps a picture that comes to your mind. Psalm 63, verse 1 says, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you. In a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. And because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. And your right hand upholds me. Let's take another few seconds to meditate on his word, meditate on the word or the phrase or maybe the picture that God gave you as I was reading that. And start asking Holy Spirit, what does this mean to me? What are you trying to speak to me? And we're going to read it one more time. And in the same way, if God hasn't given you a word or a phrase or a picture yet, 
Ask him right now. Say, Holy Spirit, would you speak to me? Psalm 63. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. And because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds. Take a few seconds to meditate on that one more time. And what I want to encourage you is to write it down. Once, once I pray out after this, I want to encourage you to write down the word, the phrase, and whatever God puts in your heart. So, Father, we just thank you for today, Lord. We thank you, God, for all that you have done and all who you are, Lord. And you, God, yes, you are our God. And earnestly, we will seek you. We thirst for you, Jesus. Our whole being longs for you. We have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. And because your love is better than life, our lips will glorify you in every single moment. And we will praise you as long as we live. We will lift our hands to you. And we'll be fully satisfied. And we will praise you all the days. And we will continuously remember you and the things that you have done for us. Because you are our help. We will sing to you. Your right hand upholds us. And we are just grateful for who you are, God. Would you increase our desperation for you, Lord? Would you open our eyes and our hearts to you? And give us something new. Something that we have never experienced before. And we choose to linger in your presence. We choose to linger even in this moment. Even after the video is done, Lord. We choose to sit and linger in your presence. Lord. So, Father, we just thank you. We honor you. And we praise you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. We love you guys. We can't wait to see you next week. Um, so you guys have a great rest of your day.